you very much. I'm just going to start off here and then I will kind of move over there. Am I sounding okay? I'm not used to, I think I'm going to be on the X Factor. Um, okay, just listening to Richard, I was really struck, by the way, I'm Orla, that obviously is Peter. Um, I was really struck in the introduction that when somebody's introduced or we're welcomed, it kind of implies that we've arrived somewhere. We're here now. Um, and I suppose one of the things in mindfulness is that very often we think we're here, but we're actually not. So even while that was happening, I was even struck thinking, God, I hope we stick to time tonight, I hope it'll go okay, I hope we'll be able to work this. Uh, also, really importantly, I was thinking, I hope my children will clean the kitchen before I get home. <laughs> and I'm sure some of you were also thinking about, did I turn the, cars off, the lights off in the car? Um, you know, just will the, my questions be answered? Um, even the seat's a bit uncomfortable, I hope we won't go too far over. You know, did many of you find any of those sort of things happening? Yeah. Yeah. So what I'd like to do was I would actually like to invite you to arrive. Um, so to do that, what I would ask is that for those of you who are sitting and those of you who are standing, just settle yourselves. Take a moment to settle yourself. See, you all thought you'd arrived and you're all moving. <laughs> you know, so settle, literally take your moment to arrive here. And to do that, it's two feet flat on the floor. And if you're standing, it's just your two feet flat up, straight up and standing up. Because you don't need to sit for this. You can stand, you can lie, you can do it at the bus, you can do it you know, at the bar ordering your drink. You can actually do this. Um, so having done that, what I would invite you to do is just for a moment to close your eyes. And if that's not comfortable for you, that's fine. You may keep them open and just lock your gaze at something at eye level or below. And just let that be your focus for the next few moments, okay? And just as you are there, just take a moment to tune in. Be aware of your feet on the floor. Be aware, if you're sitting, of your bottom and your back against the chair. Be aware as you breathe out of a sense of letting go. So as you breathe in, as you breathe out, just let your shoulders drop, let your body settle into your chair. And just notice how your mind tends to wander. How long more is she going to do this? You know, just notice that. And as you notice it, just befriend your mind. It's doing what it's meant to do. But what your piece is, is to befriend it and just gently bring it back to, actually, I'm paying attention now on purpose to my bottom and my back on the chair. Or if I'm standing, I'm paying attention to my hands down by my sides. And I just take a moment to listen. Just be aware of the sounds that are present to you right now. And then just move into your breathing and just notice where your breath enters and where it leaves. That's it. We're not about changing anything or doing anything differently. We're just about taking a moment to tune in to this moment. Okay. And just give yourselves a little, sh little stretch and come right back. Now, welcome. <laughs> welcome. What you've just done is actually one of the great practices, one of the basic practices of mindfulness, which is actually to be here now. I'm going to be over there now because I have to move to that speaker. Um, she says, hoping that she's going to be able to, yes, to be here now. This is, people who know me will uh, know the mindfulness class that we do here will know this is my jar. Okay, this jar is actually what my, a representation of mindfulness. When we're thinking about, hope they'll clean the kitchen, how long is this going to go on for, um, did I turn the lights off, we're actually, we're moving. Our mind is active, it's kind of all, and depending on how much is going on in our head will dictate how cloudy this becomes, okay? And it's very hard to think when it's actually this cloudy. So doing mindfulness means in being here now, just take, see even in that moment, can you even see, it might be hard down the back, you can actually just start to see how it settles. Just a moment can make such, such a difference. And that's what we're about in mindfulness. We're about being here now. And what we hope to cover now, this evening, is the what, who, where, when, how of mindfulness, um, to do an overview of the research, to look at factors that have created a growing interest in mindfulness, because, you know, as Richard um, alluded, it's the top selling book on the book list. You know, there's a lot of reasons why it is as popular as it is at the moment. And then, a bit like you've just done, some practical exercises for you to take away with you 
to start introducing mindfulness into your own lives. Okay? And Peter and I will be doing a bit of a tag team and I'm going to come to how that's going to flow in a minute. So what is mindfulness? It's what you've just done. It's paying attention on purpose, non-judgmentally. And that was that bit about noticing going, oh my God, my head's all over the place. She keeps telling me to focus. Oh, and I'm thinking about stuff. It's that non-judgmental piece that goes, oh, that's okay. Just catch it, notice it, bring it back. Don't judge it. Moment to moment. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? And yet, we struggle so hard to do some of the most <laughs> straightforward things. Um, and the big piece in mindfulness is not about being as, um, you know, kind of that we're all very calm and very zen and all this kind of stuff. Because believe me, I can get hot under the collar like anybody else and so can Peter. The difference in being when you can be mindful is this whole idea of you can't stop the waves of life. It's about learning to surf. And if we can tune in at our moments, however long they are, it can help us to settle. And when we are settled in ourselves, we are better able. And be better able, better able to think, better able to do, better able to get the things done that we need to do. And that's what we're aspiring to in mindfulness. Okay? And John Kabat-Zinn would be considered a sort of uh, the modern, um, I was going to say forefather, but that's not easy. He's kind of created the whole modern piece of mindfulness. It's been around for forever, um, but he has created it as an actual, as an intervention um, and as a practice for, for using in every day. So what mindfulness does is it taps into our own natural resources. It doesn't require expensive gizmos. We don't have to go off and learn really complicated techniques. It uses what we've already got. And the three key things that it uses are it uses, as you did, it uses your senses. What can I hear right now? What can I feel right now? It uses our own bodies and it uses our breath. They are the three key things that we use in mindfulness. Okay? And we've all got all three and they don't actually cost us any money. And as I've said already, you've got a practice that you can do standing at the bus, sitting on the bus, you know, out for a night with friends or whatever. It's always that question of, am I actually here now? Have I actually arrived here? Okay? And in the doing of that, in the tapping into those resources, what we do is we create headspace. And how many times have we heard others, as well as ourselves, saying, God, I wish I could just get some headspace. You know, and that's the piece. Um, and there's a, Viktor Frankl has a very famous quote that is used in mindfulness in, between the stimulus and the response lies our power. You know, between that sort of, react, some, somebody, something happens, and our response to it. That's where our power lies, where we have that moment where we can actually make, di make a different choice. You know those times when somebody says something and you're like, I can't believe you said that. It's the moment before you react. If you can tap into it, that's where the power lies. Does that make sense? So, you're all going to run out and be Buddhists after tonight. <laughs> Okay, as you can see, and I have to put this in, Peter's mother actually thought that this was Peter. <laughs> so the bottom line with this is no, you absolutely don't have to be a Buddhist. I mean, it is embedded, and I just need to... Numbers are not my thing, so I have to kind of check to get the numbers right. We're talking 2,500-year-old tradition embedded in Buddhism, yes. Um, but actually... In our modern world, mindfulness is a Western non-sectarian research-based uh, form of meditation, uh, which while it is derived from that 2,500-year-old Buddhist tradition, uh, there's actually evidence of it in all of the great traditions. So therefore, it doesn't really belong to anybody. So we can all do it. Does it matter what our background is or our beliefs are? The other thing is that, as you notice, yes, there are two presenters this evening. And on one hand, you could say, well, that might half the workload, making our lives easier, probably. Um, or, or what we really wanted to show is mindfulness isn't a female thing or a male thing. You know, it's everybody's thing. Also, for age, there is no age. You know, teenagers all the way up can do it, and they're using it a lot in education. I'm not going to say which of us is going to represent which end of the age spectrum here, but it's that piece, it's for everybody. And the adolescent form of mindfulness training is known as dot B. For the adults, it's just known as mindfulness. Um, so it's for all of us. And because it has such a huge evidence base, um, that's what gives it its traction. 
Okay, so mindfulness is for all of us at any stage in our life. Okay, but what it isn't, and this is a key thing, is some of you, when you were doing that exercise, may have found that some of you may have relaxed. Some of you may, may have found that you were really uptight. And that's, re <coughs> mindfulness is not a relaxation technique. Okay, that is what it is not. Relaxation can be a byproduct, but what it actually is, is a self-care piece. Because there's times when you go to practice a mindfulness and actually your head is all over the place. And it's not about changing it and making it different. It's about accepting it as it is. And in the tuning in, it's a bit like tuning in to the radio. You know when you're kind of in between stations and you get all the static and there's loads of stuff going on and the more you refine it, the clearer it gets. That's what it is. And if you relax as a consequence, that's a consequence. But it isn't the actual intention when you start out. The space is the consequence. Okay? So that's our who, that's our when, the black magic moment, any time, any place, anywhere. Um, the other piece then is, is this actually a fad? Um, and there's a lot of talk at the moment that mindfulness is actually a fad. But I suppose the fact that it's been around for 2,500 years really says that it's not a fad. Um, but also, it is grabbing the headlines at the moment. Um, it made the front pages, uh, front, the cover of Time magazine this year. The Huffington Post has named 2014 the year of mindfulness. Um, it's been listed as one of Time magazine's 100 best new scientific discoveries of the 21st century. Um, and uh, the practitioners now don't just include the Dalai Lama, but actually the majority of the Fortune 500 execs are known to practice um, mindful meditation or other types of meditation. Um, and it's been used now in education and in business. So its track record is there. And the reason its track record is there, above and beyond all things, is the research. And if you just take a look at this graph, what you will see is 1980, there's very little. And that's because in 1975, John Kabat-Zinn, who I mentioned earlier on, set up this, an eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction program. He himself was a molecular biologist. And he realized, he had a, a meditative practice himself, in looking at the brain scans of Buddhist monks and Joe Bloggs, there was a difference. And he was trying to figure out what was the difference? And actually realized, well, what do they do that we don't do? And what they did was they meditated. So we looked at how could he translate what they do into our everyday lives and devised this program and started running the first one in 1975. So from 1975 to 82, he was busy trying it out, trying it on for size. And then slowly little bits of research started to come. And it was very slow, very slow in the beginning. One, two, um, very slowly, up until about 2000. And then it starts to pick up steam. And you can see between 2000 to, to 2012, the amount of research has gone up. 477 papers in, in 2012. In 2013, um, there was actually over 500 papers. And so far in 2014, we're already at nearly 200 research papers into the evidence base for being here now, using your breath, your body, and your senses. In 1976, over 1,500 studies had been conducted by over 250 independent research institutes showing mindfulness meditation to be clinically effective for the management of stress, anxiety, panic, chronic pain, depression, obsessive thinking, strong emotional reactivity, and a wide array of medical conditions, <coughs> including pain, um, cancers, um, and strong neurological conditions. The University of Massachusetts Medical School runs a mindfulness-based program, one of these eight-week programs, um, and they looked at the medical outcomes of 15,000 patients. 15,000 patients um, were surveyed, and they found a 35% reduction in the number of medical symptoms and a 40% reduction in psychological symptoms. It's amazing by actually being here now, by using our senses, our body and our breath, that we can make such a difference to our well-being. It's quite staggering, really. There's also now a monthly newsletter that is produced to try and keep up, keep people up to date with what's actually happening in the research world, and every month it's updated. So for March alone, there was another 50 papers. It's a lot. So the evidence is all there. And it's interesting in looking at the 2000 to 2014, as we have, 
And okay, what was the thing that really spurred it on? Why has it suddenly become so prolific? And the reason is this material world that we live in. That was the time when technology really kicked in. Our 24 hour, seven day a week living. We don't stop, we're constantly available, we're constantly accessible to everybody and we the Irish, more so than anybody else, are spending half our time on our phone. We've got our head in the freezer section picking up the dinner and somebody's phoning us to tell us something else while we're actually waving at our neighbour and thinking about the car in the car park. And we're going to be doing that like every minute for the next 24 hours, for the next seven days, because we don't stop. And that's where our material world piece has kicked in. And that's where the research has literally kind of gone along in, in, in tandem with it. Um, and it's quite staggering. There's also been um, a difference found between people um, and their symptomatology, those living in urban versus rural, um, where the impact is, it's not as great. Us city dwellers are faster in our thinking, faster in the way that we do things. We are quicker because we're nearly in fight or flight all the time. We don't even realise it. Kind of trying to get in and out of the traffic, trying to get to the shops, trying to get everywhere. Um, we're accelerated. Um, and all we want, what we really want is time. And the way that we can do that, because we can't obviously create more minutes in our hours and more hours in our days, how we can actually start to create that for ourselves is learn to balance the demands in our life. They're not going to go away, remember? We don't, it's not about calming our seas. It's about this learning to surf bit. And what we can do is pause. Connect with what's going on for us. Randomly throughout our day. And attend to it and befriend ourselves. Just as you did when you arrived or thought you had arrived. Give yourself your moment. Okay, I'm going to do, we're going to do a seamless transition. <laughs> so it's really great that so many people are hearing and talking about mindfulness, but many people may be st still sort of wondering, how does mindfulness actually improve my mental health? How does it improve my ability to cope with life's stressors? And that's a fair question to ask. <clears throat> and if we look at all the research across all the populations in the world, um, you'll see reoccurring themes emerge. Uh, one of which is training our attention. So if we look at the, the definition, John kabat definition, training our attention, what is the big deal about attention? And the thing about attention is that is the lens in which we filter or shape our experience. So what we pay attention to becomes more illuminated. It becomes more real. It becomes our reality. And yet we've never received any training in it. Uh, it's amazing we've got, got this far, in fact. Um, and the reason why we've got this far is because our attention is geared towards survival. It's geared towards what's missing, what's wrong, where the next threat is. So, for example, my attention, if I do ten things today, six of which went really well, two, two went sort of neutral, and two didn't go so well, Maybe there are things tonight that I wish I would have said or I didn't say quite clearly. What am I going to be left with thinking about just before bedtime? Those two things that didn't go so well. Um, and the thing about attention is it's fluid. It's movable. It's shiftable. Uh, and we'll demonstrate that in an exercise in a few minutes' time. So it's about training this, this muscle uh, that, a bit like going to the gym, becomes stronger. It's also about developing a different relationship with our thoughts. Um, it's not about thinking any less. It's about changing our relationship to our thoughts. So I was running a mindfulness course in town recently, and I was speaking to one of the participants, and she said that what she gained from the course was it gave her freedom from her thoughts, um, that she was more than her thoughts, uh, that, that actually she could begin to see her thoughts as mental events, not her reality, uh, and begin to question maybe some of these thoughts that, that are kind of like unreliable opinions, like our own sort of propaganda machine. We also need to be able to come in into touch with our emotions, being able to regulate our emotions. We can try to deny them, that we don't have them. I've tried, it doesn't work. Um, 
Imagine a beach ball and try to place it under the water. Yeah, maybe you can do that, but as soon as you take your hands off it, it's going to rocket back at you at twice the intensity. And that is the same with our emotions. We need to be able to identify them, understand them, and be with them in a way that feels safe uh, and manageable. And mindfulness provides that space uh, that when, when we feel it grounded, we can, we can begin to do that. We also need to develop more compassion towards ourselves because if we don't, uh, maintaining compassion for other people is sort of long term, very difficult to sustain. And as Orla mentioned about the, the brain imagery, we're beginning to find out uh, what we pay attention to in particular affects the brain. The evidence uh, following long-term meditators saw areas of the brain associated with well-being become more activated. Um, and that can, happen, that can happen within a short space of time, and they're, 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 even amongst populations who've got a history of depression. So let's look at thoughts in a bit more detail. So on a given day, we have between 60 to 70,000 thoughts. <coughs> And they're just guessing. It probably goes up by about 10,000 every year. And so that's a lot of thinking. And a lot of the time, we're thinking without even realizing it. So one of the things mindfulness offers is a sort of an awareness to the, the types of thoughts that we're having. And what research tells us is, is that 80% of our thoughts is the same as the thoughts we had yesterday. So they're quite repetitive, uh, quite cyclical. Um, and it's about developing a different relationship with them. A lot of the times we're living in our heads, and that the characteristics of living in our heads, what we call the doing mode, is things like judgment, criticizing, analysis, comparing, which isn't a particularly uh, receptive friend when you're struggling with your mood. You end up judging your mood, criticizing, I'm here, I want to be here. Why, why does this keep on happening to me? And we end up really, really struggling and being hard on ourselves at the same time. So in mindfulness, what we're trying to do is activate what we call a sensing mode, learning how to be with our present moment experience by cultivating a greater connection with our bodies or whatever we're doing and engaging the mind other than just thinking. And when our minds are engaged in what they're doing, our mind naturally settles. So a bit like that jar of water. It was shaken up, so what it needs to calm down is space and, to, and, and, and just time and to be engaged. Another thing we're looking at in mindfulness is what we do to nourish ourselves, what we do to, to look after our own well-being. We all have a mental health and we all have a need to to really look after ourselves. Many people describe uh, struggling day to day uh, and putting on a mask, uh, that whole effort of just slogging your way through the day, putting on a, a facade that eventually becomes more and more exhausted. So one of the things we're looking at in mindfulness is looking at where do I get my nourishment from? How do I recharge my batteries? Um, and where do I source pleasure from? And one of the consequences of being really busy is that we operate on an automatic pilot, which means we superficially engage in what we're doing. So kind of everyday activities become like automatic, where in time, if we engage with them more through our senses, they can become more pleasurable. Because if we don't, we won't feel like we're surfing with the waves. We'll feel like we're going against them. We'll feel like we're at their mercy, getting pounded and pounded, even drowning in the waves. So what do we do? So I would invite you now to pause, sit comfortably in your chair, And if you can, close your eyes uh, or bring your gaze towards the ground. And just ensure you're as comfortable as you can be. 
just check the position of your shoulders so you're not generating any unnecessary tension. We're going to do an exercise now using our senses and looking at attention. So keeping your head still, just for now, and your eyes closed or gaze towards the ground, I want you to see if you can bring your attention to your feet. So without moving your toes or moving your feet, I would invite you to see if it's possible to sense your feet, feel them. You might notice sensations like warmth, tingling, or the contact with the ground. And if you can, without moving your feet, I'd like you to nod your head just so that you can feel them. Okay. And now what I invite you to see if it's possible to bring your attention to your hands. Perhaps your hands are in contact with each other or resting on your lap. Bring some curiosity to your hands and see if it's possible to feel them without moving them. And if you can, I'd like you to nod your head. Okay. And now I'd invite you to bring your attention to sounds. Sounds in the room. The sound of silence. The quality of silence. Maybe even distant sounds like traffic. And now I invite you to bring your attention back to your feet. Again, seeing if it's possible to tune into them by experiencing the sensation of the feet in contact with the ground. Socks in the skin, feet in the shoe, feet in contact with the ground. And if that's possible, I would ask you to nod your head. Okay, now just tuning into your breath, just noticing your breath, breathing in and breathing out. It's not about judging your breathing, there's no technique required. It's just noticing the air flowing in and the air flowing out. And I would ask you to open your eyes. So that was just a short exercise just to demonstrate the fact that our attention is fluid. It's movable. But that we can move it around. And when we do, wherever we place it becomes larger, brighter, bigger. If we look at the brain, we're starting with a slight disadvantage. Uh, we're born with a design flaw. Our brains are more geared towards survival than quality of life or happiness. So that means every day, just like myself or anyone else, that we are geared towards scanning for what's wrong. What's wrong with our experience? What's wrong with this room? What's wrong with something maybe we did today? <coughs> or, or potentially where the next wrong or threat or danger is coming from. And that's how we've, we've managed to survive. It's how we've managed to kind of outmaneuver threats or disease and you know, constantly scanning for what's wrong. It's like our brain is like Velcro for negative experiences. So that means it sticks and Teflon for positive ones. So it becomes less sticky. So it's like those six things that went really well, you know, I have this, like everyone else, this natural design flaw that it makes, you know, it, it doesn't feel that it connects as much, you know, because I'm drawn towards what I could have done better. Uh, so in mindfulness, what we're trying to do is make that Teflon brain a bit more like Velcro, you know, try bringing those positive experiences more alive. 
And how we do that is through a gratitude practice. So that would be like the antidote. So it's about noticing things that you do every day that went well. Not in a mechanical way, by saying, oh yeah, it was a nice, um, you know, I did this thing, or somebody gave me a compliment. It's actually giving some serious time, about 20 seconds. And that could be, you know, you, you reflect on it for 20 seconds, or uh, many people write it down in, in maybe a gratitude journal or in a diary. I knew, I knew a lady who really struggled with this issue, and, um, but she was up for a challenge. She didn't really believe, she thought it was kind of a bit of like mumbo jumbo. But she, to be fair, she kept a journal for six months. And you know, over time, that part of her brain, she described it, is becoming more, more strong. She was constantly on the lookout for things that went well. And it could be things that she was pleased with, or things that she noticed, could be kind of events, or it could be something that you noticed somebody else doing. So even bringing herself out of her own experience and noticing kind of you know, acts of kindness, acts of um, generosity um, uh, outside. So I would invite you to, to practice this. This isn't going to cost any money, but it could be of great value to, to anybody who tries it. Okay. And then people just tell me, um, do you know what you need? Um, just be in the present. Yeah? Be in the moment. Uh, which is quite challenging to do. Uh, they reckon being in the present lasts for about three seconds. Yeah. So, um, best of luck. Uh, <laughs> um, so being, yeah, being in the being in the present takes some time, takes some training. Because if you look at those mirrors, you know, we're constantly being drawn back into the past or projecting into the future. We experience some difficulty. The mind doesn't like it and wants a solution. So it gets into thinking mode, which can get us into difficulty. It's a bit like stirring up that jar of water. So what we're trying to do in mindfulness is actually, hang on a minute, let's just, how am I at the moment? How am I in the body, tuning into my breath, and actually having some headspace where I can make a decision on what I need to do at this particular moment. So your greatest ally will be your body and your breath. And wherever you find yourself in life, uh, your greatest asset that you'll ever have will be your body. Constantly repairing itself, regenerating, um, healing itself. So what we really need to do is give the body what it needs. I mean, it needs nourishment, it needs night, uh, light, it needs rest. Uh, Deepak Chopra calls it the exquisite pharmacy. Uh, we often, we might be uh, quite concerned what it looks like, but maybe not that connected to how we are in our bodies. So the root out of living in our heads is more connecting with our bodies. So things like mindfulness, yoga, tai chi, anything that's a body practice based is a good route to that. If we look back in a, a few weeks ago, it's an interesting situation arose with Jonathan Sexton. Like everybody, we all have to deal with doubt. We have thoughts, these thoughts, mental events, that we're not good enough. We compare ourselves to other people. We struggle with failure. We've become averse to failure. So a few weeks ago, playing, pa playing um, in, fr in France, in Paris, he missed his, people remember his first two kicks. So he missed his first two kicks is he going to have doubt? Well, he's human, so he is going to have doubt, but what he needs to do at that particular moment is to focus. He's training his attention. He's tuning into the ball in his hands. He's tuning into his breath, calming his body down, and his feet in contact with, his ground, with the ground. And he's looking at what he needs to do, and he's self-regulating, and he's focusing. He's not looking at the uh, French crowd asking them, well, what do you think I should do? He's doing what he needs to, need, needs to do, and he's, that's come from his practice. And the benefits of mindfulness come from the practice itself. It doesn't come from reading, reading about it too much. It comes from the
the practice. That's the that's where the, the, the gem where we release our inner resources. That's where that comes from. Okay. Seamless transition. Um, okay, so what can we do? What can you walk away with um, with mindfulness? And I suppose the most obvious thing that we can do is we can, okay, as Peter said, we can go and read the books. We can read the books and we can listen to the CDs and we can do all of that. And yes, it will give you great insights coming to talks like this. But really, what we need to do is we need to learn how. Actually, need to learn how to practice it. Because you can have read all the books, but actually know nothing about mindfulness unless you've practiced it um, and had the utter frustrations, the gut wrenching moments when you want to do anything but sit in the chair and do the bits that you need to stay still for. Then that's, that is that is the mindfulness piece and realizing it does, it's not about getting it right. It's just about doing it, tuning in, being here now, paying attention. Um, so yes, you can do that. The other thing is you can do is you can sign up for a mindfulness-based stress reduction course or an MBSR. There's loads of them, they're everywhere. Um, we're looking at the future of possibly doing some here in the hospital, but in the meantime, check them out. Um, they're eight weeks. Um, I can tell you it'll be possibly, eight. it's one night a week for eight weeks. It'll be one of the best eight week evenings that you'll have spent. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can log on to our own website, www.sjoghosp.ie, and if you link on to specialist treatments, and we actually have a kind of a web page for mindfulness and relaxation, we have the two of them there, and we have podcasts and recordings of guided meditations, different kind of diet guided ones, short ones, long ones, um, and they would recommend that you know if you're getting into mindfulness, you start with the moment, and a moment, it's individual. Your moment could be two seconds, that's your moment. It could be five minutes, then that's your moment. Some of you may be great and be able to do 20 minutes, that's great. But it's not about, oh my God, they do 20 minutes, I should do 20 minutes. Your moment is your moment, and you start as small as you can, and then you can build up slowly, okay? In the hospital, we run mindfulness as an inpatient. We've run inpatient groups, Peter, myself, and another colleague. And we started them as groups because we had done a lot of individual work around mindfulness. But we started them actually as groups on the inpatient service in 2011. And it is actually now one of our highest and most consistent demands, uh, demanded group since we started it. Um, and we recently did a survey uh, where we got 88 out of 94 respondents said that they would now consider mindfulness as a key part of their wellness. You know, that's, that's huge. And that's from people just kind of getting into the practice and the doing of it. And how we do it is actually, as Peter, Peter mentioned, Phil, not paying attention, um, is that thing of noticing when we're an automatic pilot. Do you know those days when you're in the car and you're going to the shops and you kind of go, how did I get here? God, I can't actually remember driving the car. Or you're halfway up the stairs and you go, what am I doing here? There are moments when you've stepped out of your automatic pilot um, and you're kind of going, Gosh, I can't remember what it was that I was supposed to be doing. So it's to notice that you're in automatic pilot um, and to get into what we refer to as mindful living. And it, as I said before, it doesn't mean that you're going to be the calmest person on the block. Believe me, I know from experience you won't be. You'll be better than the person that you would have been. Um, but what it really means is, you know, that you, you do slow down. You do less, yes, but you engage more. And in doing that, you achieve more. And there's the rub. I actually achieve more. Because we often think it's about how much did I do and how much did I achieve and how much did I do, 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 and we kind of get caught up in this kind of, you know, maelstrom and it's back to my jar. We kind of think we're doing great, but in fact, we're in a heap by the end of it. You know those days at the end of it and you actually feel like uh, the, the, the marathon runner? I am so spent, don't ask me to do that again. I'm exhausted. Whereas the sprinter is the person who does it in a burst, stops, recovers, and in that short period of recovery is able to come back and do it again. I'm going to leave this here as an exercise because we've only got about 10 minutes left. And in the 10 minutes, I'm going to kind of really give it a go. And in the 10 minutes, we're going to see how still and how clear it will be, just so that you would know what that would be like for yourselves if you did a 10 minute piece. The other piece that you can do is from today, just decide I will do just one thing at a time. <gasps> Sounds so easy, doesn't it? I will do one thing at a time. <coughs> so instead of the multitasking that we do, which actually can results in us actually multi-missing and multi-stressing, do one thing. So if you're pushing the trolley, push the trolley. 
If you're driving the car, drive the car. If you're giving out to the kids, give out to the kids. I'll be with you in a minute. Just one thing at a time. And it sounds really easy and it's not. But it's the challenge. And that's the mindful bit to realise, am I actually doing the one thing at a time? And to bring yourself into that pause where you stop and realise, I'm not paying attention. You know, even brushing your teeth, one thing at a time. So many people wonder about accepting, acceptance. Is, does that mean mindfulness is about being passive and just putting up with stuff or just being resilient to put up with stuff that just really doesn't work for you? And it's, it's about wise engagement, not passive acceptance and complacency. Uh, Larry Rosenberg, a famous um, meditation teacher, said, if a mindful person was in a burning building, do you think they'd be sitting calmly, meditating, <laughs> watching the flames, appreciating their lovely orange colour, and sensing the smoke? No, they'd be the first person out the door because they would have smelled the smoke, and they'd be standing from a safe distance, being fully aware of what's happening, uh, but not putting themselves in danger. Yeah? So it's about showing up, paying attention, doing what you need to do, speaking your truth, and letting go. And sometimes that showing up is knowing when to show, show up. I spoke to somebody earlier on today and they were talking about the difference in terms of their interactions. So they're knowing when, hang on a minute, I need a little bit of space. I'll go through them for a shortcut if I speak to them right now. So I just need five minutes and I'll come back to you. And then the interaction, you know, having a different dynamic and being better for, for, for everybody concerned. And then there's the very busy people, you know, the people who've got no time whatsoever. So this is a little special exercise for you. Um, whenever you're waiting, whether it's in a queue or in a traffic jam, there's your mindful moment. Um, so if we look at the uh, six people, who do we reckon is the most mindful? Second, second from the front, yeah? So everyone else is either doing something or daydreaming or checking things. So but that's your time off. That's your like your mini pause. So if you're there standing in the queue, you're feeling your feet in the ground, you're checking your posture, you're checking in with your breath, you think, how am I at the moment? So it's about developing that awareness, that, that pause through the day. You don't need any more time because, you know, if you watch people queuing, what you'll see is people checking, checking in. So having that little space, that bit of headspace in your day, can really make a difference. And it's actually breaking a habit. Because we often lose ourselves in technology. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we almost define ourselves by our Facebook likes, uh, or how many texts we get in a day, or always having to check in. And one of the things in, in, for example, going on retreat has taught me that, you know, it's about switching off the phone occasionally or putting some boundaries into how much I interact with it. And actually what happens in the mind, that the mind, like this jaw, settles down. Every information that you come into contact with on a, on a given day needs to be processed. And sometimes it's not even emotionally neutral. It might create some longing. Um, but essentially what you're doing is you're creating some activity for the brain to, to, and putting stress on what we call the working memory. And if you think about the volume of information that we have to uh, contend with on a given day compared to nowadays, compared to 100 years, you know, it's, it's a huge difference. Yet our brains are the same. So demand is now greater than, the, if you like, than the bandwidth uh, of, of what we have. So it's about being, more, being mindful around technology as well. If you want to take that a step further, instead of 24-7, how about 24-6? Has anyone ever heard of Sunday? 
Um, and, and, and whether it's Sunday or a day during the week, it's about a day where the rhythm of the day ideally goes a bit slower. Uh, it's about resting. It's about engaging more with what you do. And perhaps it's about switching off devices. Perhaps it's about going into nature or having a long lunch or, or a rest. Whatever works for you is the, is the key. Um, it's not about doing, doing what I recommend. Or it's doing what works for you in your life um, and finding something that, that nourishes you on that day of rest. I think that's the, that's the key. In, and creating the natural conditions where this happens. Yeah? Okay, so that's kind of being your whistle-stop tour, if you like, over uh, mindfulness. So the pieces, that I suppose, that we would invite you to take home, um, if you would like to, are uh, the whole fact that mindfulness is a training. It is a training, okay? It takes practice, it takes time, but above all, it takes compassion. So it doesn't matter. You don't, it's not about getting it right. It's not about how long you do it. Um, you know, it's just the fact that you do, that you take time to start paying attention because um, it requires you to turn up. Turn up to your life, turn up to your moment, turn up to this day. Uh, try doing one thing at a time. If it's learning to wait in a queue, use your senses more. Even just listening. I'm listening to that bird out there. And it's interesting, I was away a couple of weekends ago and there was a few of us away and it was beautiful, the sun was shining, it was gorgeous and there was birds singing and actually a lot of us were kind of going, isn't this lovely? And one person said, if that bird doesn't shut up, I'm going to go and throw a bucket of water over itself. <laughs> you know, we were just in completely different moments. But that was their moment. Tuned in, took notice, okay? Uh, build in pauses to your day, whenever they will be, but do build them and take them. Look what you could have got it for that 10 minutes just sitting down, putting your feet up. This amount of clarity. You can nearly see through that. You could really think then, okay? Um, and exercise your gratitude. Be nice to yourself. If you don't remember, fine, I've just remembered now. That's okay, okay? So, to close, let's come back to being here now, okay? So again, very quickly, just settle yourselves again. See, you're all moving again. See, we kind of lose it. So settle, two feet flat on the floor, and if you're standing, equal weight. Hands resting on your lap, just let them rest. Or if you're standing, let them be by your sides. And just take this moment to allow yourself to be here now. And just notice your breath. And as you breathe out, just let your shoulders drop. Let your body settle into your chair. Let your feet settle into the floor. And just take a moment to listen. Be still. Be aware. and come back. Doesn't take long. So just to wrap up, we would just like to thank yourselves for coming, for being you know, such a, such a wonderful audience. We'd also like to thank Matthew Johnson, um, whose uh, graphics, Peter and myself actually aren't that artistic, so we uh, did steal his graphics, but he very kindly agreed to let us. Um, and we'll take our break now, and I know people will go around if you have any questions, um, and just leave you with a thought. Um, it's a thought uh, from Mahu, my, uh, I won't even say what language it is, isn't great, but it's let the eating eat, the sitting sit, the work work, and sleep sleep. On that thought, we'll both leave you for a moment. Thank you.